<laughs> He's a guitar player. And Big Bear from Big Bear. How many of you have ever been to Las Vegas? Raise your hand. Gosh, we need a Gamblers Anonymous group around here, apparently. Well, I went to Las Vegas for the first time about 20 years ago. And for a long time, I would typically take a couple of days off immediately after Easter. Because, you know, Easter is a big serve. We might have two services over the catlet or whatever. And, and, you know, it's just to kind of wind down. And so several years ago, Jan and I were planning to go to Las Vegas. But people had kind of gotten to know that I had this pattern. They go, hey, where are you going this time? It's like, ah, we're just getting away. You know, I don't know. You know, I didn't really want to say because, I mean, flying out to Vegas on Sunday afternoon following Easter services when you're the pastor. <laughs> so I said, oh, I don't know. We're just a little getaway, not, you know, whatever. And, but somewhat to our surprise, we really enjoyed it. I mean, I was kind of afraid, what with all the gambling and drinking and nude shows, it would be kind of hard to take. But, you know, we really loved it. Not, <laughs> not that stuff. I don't drink. I don't gamble. And Janet didn't want to go to the nude shows. But we enjoyed the uniqueness of it all. And these buildings are just, it's crazy that it's all there together in one place. And we had great food. We went to the cheapest show we could get, and it was Carrot Top. Remember that guy? It was actually really funny. But did you know there was a city in the Bible in the time of Christ a lot like Las Vegas? It was the city of Corinth. And here on this map, you can kind of see where it's located. You can see how far it is from Jerusalem and where Paul was, all the way over to Corinth. And that day, boy, it took a long time to travel. It's over near Greece. Corinth was along a coastline, but apart from that, there were a lot of similarities between Corinth then and Las Vegas now. For instance, Corinth had a fairly large population of about 400,000. Uh, Las Vegas has 600,000 in the meat. You know, it's more in the wider area, but about 600,000. Uh, next, Corinth was a place with a wide diversity of people. People came there from, from all over the known world. Las Vegas is also kind of a melting pot kind of place. Corinth was the center of commerce and wealth and being on the beach. It was kind of a resort area. Vegas is a resort city where people spend billions of dollars each year. And Corinth was a mecca of personal indulgence and, de and decadence. Um, there was a temple to the sex god Aphrodite. There were almost 1,000 temple prostitutes. And the so-called priests were kind of like pimps who took a cut of the prostitutes' earning. I mean, it was, a, you know, Corinth had a reputation for anything goes. Anything goes. And again, very similar to Las Vegas. Now, I say all that because for the next couple of months, we're going to look through the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. And it's really important that we gain an understanding of the context in which all of these things that we're going to talk about took place. In Acts chapter 18, we learn that as Paul traveled spreading the message of Jesus, he finally went to this city of Corinth. And many people there became followers of Christ. And Paul, in fact, stayed there for a year and a half, started a church for these new believers so they could continue trying to reach people who were spiritually lost. Now, there was actually another difference between the city of Corinth and Las Vegas besides the fact that one was on the coast and the other was in the desert, and that is Corinth's love for knowledge. They were near Athens, the philosophy, education, new learnings. There was always something new happening, some new teacher, and they were really interested in that. In that way, maybe they were more like a Berkeley, California, or around here, a Norman, Oklahoma, and back then, just as it is today, there was an underlying assumption or viewpoint that on one hand, you had knowledge and science and philosophy, and on the other hand, you had God, religion, and faith, and never the twain shall meet. You were either religious or you were intelligent. But no religious person could truly be intelligent, and no truly intelligent pe person would ever be religious. Thus, the title of today's talk, Can Academia and Faith Coexist? Now, all of us have been students at one time. Some of you are students currently or have been recently. And, you know, there are times when if you're in a, a college situation and even a high school situation where your beliefs are challenged or maybe just ignored or maybe just outright ridiculed. 
It seems as if the perception among most of academia is that if you're pro-Christian, you must be anti-intellectual. I mean, if you're pro-God, you must be anti-science. Others of you have friends or co-workers or relatives whose attitude toward your faith is less than flattering. It's as if they're like, well, you know, I really like you. I just feel badly that you're still stuck in those unenlightened beliefs. And I'll acknowledge that even the verses we're looking at today seem to have kind of an anti-intellectual slant. God says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And where is the wise man, the scholar, the philosopher? Has God not made the foolish the wisdom of the world? And so forth. Nevertheless, today, I want to argue that God and the Bible are not anti-intellectual. Religion is not the enemy of science, and science need not be the enemy of religion. However, biblical Christianity faces extraordinary challenges in the 21st century. Incredible advances in science and technology have, made, have transformed people's worldview. You know, this enormous progress seems to have left religion behind, right? While we're experiencing quantum leaps in physics, genetics, medicine, uh, technology, and so forth, churches and other religious institutions seem to be lagging behind. And as a result, uh, many people see Christianity on the defensive against the onslaught of all this scientific progress. So perhaps we need to be reminded that Jesus never said things like, hey, you know, suppress your reason, suppress your intelligence, and follow me. Check your brain at the door, blindly do whatever I say. He never said that. In fact, in Matthew 20, 22, he said, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. And the Apostle Paul, who is the author of this book to First Corinthians, of First Corinthians, was evidence exhibit A of the fact that academia and faith can coexist. Growing up and prior to his conversion, Paul was educated in the most respected schools of his time. He was so advanced, in fact, it would not be a stretch to say that he had achieved the equivalent level of what we might consider a doctorate degree. And Dr. Paul argued that there is a difference between the world's wisdom and God's wisdom. According to a man named Russell Acoff, a systems theorist and professor of organizational change at Washington University, he says the content of the human mind can be classified into five categories. First is data, just like an address, the name of a plant, a number, just basic data. Then there's information, like the plane is on time, the water is cold. Number thir three is knowledge, which could be thought of as the accumulation of more information. Fourth is understanding, which is the capacity to comprehend and use knowledge effectively and to grasp meaning. And finally, wisdom, which calls upon all of the above to create sound judgment, insight, and discernment. We human beings are not born wise. Instead, we go through this pro uh, progression. By the time we officially, we end our official education, we have a huge database of information, knowledge that is hopefully growing toward a level of understanding. Then we enter into the school of experience of life, where we receive a different kind of education. And eventually, all of this hopefully converges and produces wisdom. However, even at its highest levels, man's wisdom is not the same as God's wisdom. And that assertion is not meant as a slam rather simply an indicator of the difference in the nature of man's wisdom from God's wisdom. For example, our schools and universities focus primarily on information, knowledge, understanding, wisdom concerning matters of this world, such as biology, engineering, communication, business, technology, medicine, law, and so forth, all of which are exceedingly important for life on this planet. If you ever go to a nation where there is a lack of information, knowledge, and understanding and wisdom in those areas, you can see the difference. But God's wisdom focuses primarily on issues like what is the purpose and meaning of life? How should we best treat our fellow human beings? You know, the establishment of morals, what is right, what is wrong, matters of the heart, transcendent truths. In fact, you can even look at it like this. On the bottom half of this are... Very important, 
but the lower level wisdom of the world that encompasses certain areas. And God's wisdom encompasses those higher level issues. They're not in conflict with each other. They're not in competition. Rather, they complement each other. In other words, God's wisdom without also having the wisdom of the world results in life on earth being very hard and usually not lasting very long. That's the way it was for a long time. But to have all the wisdom of the world and the things below without the wisdom of God coming to the inca- into the equation, that results in, well, the direction life on earth is headed right now. It's all about the wisdom and knowledge of the world and God's wisdom and his part of this equation gets pushed down. We live in an era of incredible knowledge explosion. They say mankind's knowledge used to double about once every 500 years. Now they say it doubles every two years. But with all of these advancements in the lower level type of wisdom, it has still failed failed miserably to solve the fundamental problems of humankind, like poverty, war, racism, uh, disease, political differences, all are still with us. You know, in terms of information and technology, the world is much more advanced than it used to be. In terms of morals and ethics, the world is about as bankrupt as it ever has been. So are we more enlightened? Yes. Has human wisdom proved insufficient? Yes. Well, now let's look at the question of can academia and faith coexist from a different angle. Did you know that over the centuries, missionaries around the world established literally thousands upon thousands of schools for children who otherwise would have never had an opportunity for an education? Did you know that in our country, some of the greatest universities established, such as Harvard, Yale, Princeton, were started by Christians? So it's kind of hard to buy the argument that Christianity fundamentally is anti-intellectual. However, over the years, most of those schools have abandoned their religious foundations. Where once they saw the value and the balance that religion brings to the development of intelligence and the balance that the development of intelligence brings to spiritual issues, now it's just one. Education with no religious framework or reference point. So that many, not all, but many of today's schools and universities are places where people are free to think and explore and express their thoughts and views, and virtually every viewpoint is respected except one, the Christian worldview. I'd like to say something here for those of you who are involved in education, the field of education for a job. You know, my wife teaches at OU, and and, uh, many of you I know are teachers and involved. Uh, We have a principal of a school in our church. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the C.S. Lewis Foundation Faculty Forum, but I think they bring up some very interesting and provocative issues. Here's one quote. The Christian faith at one time constituted the overarching paradigm that inspired and shaped the intellectual work of countless scholars. The momentum it generated throughout Western culture and beyond contributed vitally not only to the formation of our culture at large, but also to the development of the modern university itself. In stark contrast, all traces of this once vibrant intellectual and imaginative tradition have, within the last century, virtually disappeared from the academic landscape of mainstream higher education. Christianity's cogent and redemptive perspective on life and thought now finds few defenders, let alone dynamic proponents, within the ranks of today's teaching and research faculty. Then they concluded that this has had important consequences, negative consequences, for our society at large. For instance, the university is now void of one of the primary factors that, can, you know, that contributed substantially to its own development. It's basically abandoned one of the foundational principles on which it was uh, started. Then, when every, virtually every opinion, lifestyle, and belief are acceptable, except the Christian worldview, the university's claim to serve as a genuine marketplace of ideas is obviously compromised. But the C.S. Lewis Foundation Faculty Forum doesn't just point out the problems. Here's their challenge to those in education. They say, reject the current anti-Christian bias in favor of an intellectual stance that encourages everyone to understand and respect other people's views and beliefs, thereby fulfilling 
education stated mission to function more truly as a free marketplace of ideas. So we're asking the question, can academia and faith coexist? Here's another angle. A recent issue uh, of the Los Angeles Times surprisingly had an article that said, across the nation, scholars have begun to promote a new paradigm to academia, religion matters. In Pennsylvania, researchers are documenting how religion keeps young people from drugs and delinquency. In Cambridge, professors are pondering how faith uh, propels environmentalism and inner city economic development. Once a largely forgotten factor in social research, religion or spirituality is now a hot field of inquiry. Until recently, a long-standing academic bias toward religion has blinded some scholars into its powerful, to its powerful role in shaping both private lives and the public culture. The Center for Religion and Civic Culture at the University of Southern California is a leading player in the new research efforts. Scholars there have examined religion's effects on health care, welfare, immigration, and urban development. And hopefully, a greater interest in spiritual things coming together with academia will be a wave of the future. You know, what we don't really need and is not helpful for life on earth with mankind is the church over here, you know, and God's wisdom shouting insults at the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of the world over here shouting insults at those who embrace God's wisdom, but rather a recognition that both have much to bring to the party because life at its best for the individual person and for the entire human race Life at its best happens when you bring these two different in nature types of wisdom together. So can intellectualism, can education, can academia and faith coexist? Absolutely, and they must for there to be long-term hope for life on planet Earth. In 1 Corinthians, Dr. Paul is writing to believers who are living in an environment not that different than our own, where knowledge, education, the wisdom of man was elevated to the upper level, and God's wisdom, if considered at all, was relegated to a place of minor significance. So Dr. Paul, who himself was the ideal mixture of knowledge of the things of the world and knowledge of the things of God, he contends that while both are needed, both are necessary, in many ways, God's wisdom trumps man's wisdom. And I'll give you three ways. Number one, God's wisdom is more powerful than the wisdom of the world. Now, the human mind, the human intellect, has accomplished some amazing things. Way back before modern technology or modern construction methods, the design and the building of the pyramids of Egypt, the incredible advancements that all of us have experienced in our lifetimes in medicine, genetics, technology, and so forth. The know-how to direct a tiny rocket ship to land on a planet 35 million miles away. We can do that. And yet in the year 2021, we still struggle with issues like war, starvation, racism, terrorism, crime, broken families, abused children, loneliness, low self-esteem, inner anxiety. The human mind can enter data and information to gain knowledge. It can understand the meaning of things display judgment and discernment. But as great as those accomplishments are, God's wisdom far surpasses it. As he says, my thoughts are just not on the same level. They're not of the same nature as your thoughts. Now, every parent here at some time will hear their kids say to them, it's not fair. Everybody's doing it. Why can't I? And even when you as a parent patiently explain to them that it's for their own good, just doesn't compute. And that's because children, even teenagers, aren't yet able to fully understand the reasoning process that a parent has gained over many years of life experience, right? And in a similar way, there are times when we're just not yet able to fully grasp and understand the wisdom of God. But that does not invalidate God's wisdom. A second way that God's wisdom trumps man's wisdom is that God's wisdom is more permanent. Probably the most memorable era in human wisdom that dominated thoughts for centuries is that the earth was flat. I remember, well, we don't remember for, on our own experience, but you have heard 
That sickness, they used to believe that sickness resided in the blood. And so to get rid of sickness, you drain the blood out. And if they didn't get better, you drain more blood. And if they didn't get better, they would eventually die. But human knowledge, particularly scientific knowledge, is, is viewed as infallible. We have seen that in the past year and a half with, with COVID-19. But many things that scientists all over the world accept that is absolute fact at one time, with the, you know, the coming forth of more information and so forth, they realize, well, we need to tweak that. We need to change that. Uh, and they, they're, you know, we're forced to change our thinking. This happens all the time as research discovers new things that contradict previously held beliefs or theories. And some of what we believe today to be absolutely true will one day, no doubt, be repudiated and modified. In contrast, God's wisdom is unchanging. It is permanent, permanent, it is immutable, it is transcendent. A third way that God's wisdom trumps man's wisdom or woman's wisdom is because God's wisdom is more practical than the wisdom of the world. In other words, it works better. God's wisdom says things like don't commit adultery. And, of course, the wisdom of the world is if it feels good, do it. It doesn't matter. There are no rights and wrongs. It's only wrong if you get caught. God's wisdom says, have integrity, be honest, tell the truth. The wisdom of the world says, you have to lie to make a sale or get by on something. It's no big deal. Everybody does it. God's wisdom says, honor your father and your mother. The world's wisdom says, they're old. I'm going to live my life however I please. All right, roll the clock ahead a year, five years, 10 years, 15 years. Which wisdom? God's wisdom or the wisdom of the world, which wisdom do you think is working out better for people? How do things work out for the person who decides to ignore or defy God's wisdom? And they dishonor their parents, and they deceive others with their words, and they're unfaithful to their spouse. Those are just two, three examples. What tends to happen to people who don't honor their father and their mother, who lie and you know don't have integrity, and who are unfaithful? To their you know the answer what happens. And that's why the world's wisdom should focus on things like engineering, technology, physics, and so on, and then look to God's wisdom when it comes to moral and ethical issues. And that's how they work together. All right, here's the last uh, angle on our question. Can academia and faith coexist? And it has to do with the message of the cross. The idea that Christ died on the cross to take the penalty for our sins so that we can go to heaven when we die We've probably heard that for maybe many years, or at least for several years. We've, under, we've you know, gone through the work to understand what all that means. It makes perfect sense to some people. But to other people, even extremely intelligent people, it just seems completely implausible. Like, oh, yeah, this guy came. He died on the cross. Now if I believe in him, I, I, there's a heaven, and I go to heaven then, right? It just seems irrational, unbelievable. It just doesn't add up the cross is somewhat of a paradox because it's it's an intellectual mystery in a way but on the other hand there are children and people who don't have much you know educational opportunities who seem to be able to grasp it now if you were to go on a serious spiritual quest you decided you were going to explore and study the historical reliability of the bible you were going to get into the claims that Jesus made about himself. Did he really make those claims, the recorded history regarding the crucifixion and the resurrection and so forth? If you did your due diligence and really took it seriously, you would discover that the Christian faith is based solidly on a foundation of historical facts. Not believe it on blind faith. There are historical facts. The academia side is there. Then comes the faith part. But faith is something you and I demonstrate every day. When you take medicine, you do so because you have faith in your doctor, in your pharmacy, in the pharmaceutical company that makes the drug. When you eat at a restaurant, you're not thinking, oh, I hope they don't poison me. You, you trust that they're not going to try to kill you. When you board a plane, you have so much faith in the pilots that you literally entrust your very life into their hands. And when you choose 
Or when you come to a point where you understand what Christ did on the cross for you, your next step is putting your faith in him. That only what he did for you on the cross can be your ticket into heaven. Now, you trust your doctor. You trust the cooks at restaurants. You trust the pilots of commercial planes. You don't even know these people. You've never even met most of these people. Why is it hard to put your faith, your trust in Jesus and what he did on the cross? You know, in a city like Corinth, eventually all the personal indulgences and sins that people uh, give themselves to, they leave people pretty empty. A lot of us have experienced that in our life. We did things we wanted to do. We thought it was going to be fun. We thought it was, so we did all these things that the Bible says, yeah, don't do that stuff. And eventually we wound up usually empty and broken and feeling you know, miserable. And in a city like Corinth, eventually all of the philosophical debates and intellectualism and academia, it only gets you so far in life. Same for people around here. Some of the smartest people are not necessarily happy. They're not fulfilled. They're not living meaningful lives. True wisdom, the Bible says, begins when we recognize who God is. It says the fear of the Lord doesn't mean to be afraid of God, but to have a recognition of who he is, what he stands for, to revere him, to understand his wisdom, not the wisdom of this world, that's important too, but his transcendent kind of wisdom. When you begin to understand that, that's when life at its very best really begins. So academia and faith, obviously, they can't exist, contrary to popular opinion. And God's wisdom addresses the more eternal issues, the moral issues that we all need. All right, let's stand. We'll have our closing prayer. Thanks for coming out on Father's Day. Uh, <clears throat> Jana is not here today. She is down in southeast Oklahoma. Her dad, I think, turns 85 in a couple of months, and so she's down there. I tell her, go there every year on Father's Day. I can, you know, we can do something later for me. And uh, so anyway, she, she's there. So hopefully, uh, as Ronette mentioned, there's a lot of different kind of father situations here. Some of you are grandfathers raising your children's kids, and we just have every situation on earth is, is represented, you know, some way or another. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's no matter what kind of father you had. I was fortunate. I had a great dad, but many people didn't, and you have a heavenly father. You have to think about that. My dad's been gone 33 years, half my life. I've had my dad half of my life. I haven't, but I have a heavenly father, and all of us do. A heavenly father is perfect, loving, caring, providing, wise. Hope you have a good day. Let's pray. Lord, I'm grateful for the opportunity today to talk about something that a lot of us, even as believers, we just get pounded down. We get beaten down by the constant messages of the media and, and uh, most educational situations where faith, and God's wisdom are just minimized, if not uh, ridiculed. And today, God, we've had the opportunity to see uh, that both are important. But only one is eternal. Only one truly has eternal ramifications, and that's your wisdom. And even while we can't completely understand how what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago buys our ticket into heaven, Lord, that's, that is a theme that I will uh, celebrate and I will declare for the rest of my life because it is the central theme of the Bible that we are loved by our Creator and we matter to you. Every single one of us, we all matter to you and we're thankful for that today. And I pray, God, that this would today give us a balance in our minds and our hearts to maybe stand stronger in our faith and to feel better and more confident in our faith. And we thank you for the time together. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming out. You have a great Father's Day.